Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on structural analysis. We just finished talking about one force and two force connections. We're now going to talk about moment connections. So we're working out of chapter three, section two. This is the third of our series of videos from section two. So we are labeling this video C. We're dealing with moment connections or sometimes referred to as rigid joints or fixed joints. Those three expressions shall be taken to mean one and the same thing, and we will use them interchangeably. Okay, this is support type three, which is a so-called fixed joint, or a rigid connection, or a moment connection. And I'm going to use all three of those terms because they all three occur in the literature. So get used to that notion. A fixed connection, a rigid connection, or a moment connection are basically all the same thing. So they, a connection of this sort can provide a reactive force in any direction, which is required for the stability of the structure and can also provide a reactive pure moment of any magnitude and, and either positive or negative clockwise or counterclockwise that's required for stability of the structure. And symbolically, by the way, we symbolically represent that by this thing coming in and connecting over its full depth to something or other here that's expressed to mean something very sturdy and rigid. The reality is that most moment connections that occur at a column, for example, will occur because there's continuity of the beam right through that uh, connection. But there are ways of making this connection between this beam and some dissimilar type structure through welding or bolting that does achieve effectively a full moment connection there, the full strength of the beam. Okay, so this is the symbolic expression of that as a fixed joint, and here we have a force P applied to the end of this, and by the way, we need no other support here because this supplies everything. It supplies a vertical force, a horizontal force, and any kind of moment that's required. So the second diagram, we're taking this symbolic expression and, ex and uh, being more explicit about it in that we're saying somehow that thing can supply a vertical force, Ry, a horizontal force, Rx, and this moment, M. We've also broken down the force P into PY and PX. So in practice, we can get moment connections in a variety of ways. This is one we've already referred to. This is the Sears Tower. Uh, basically, they're vertical wide flange elements. They're actually not wide flanges. They're plate girders. Um, because they're deeper than anything that was rolled, particularly at the time that this building was built. But also the plate girders give you the ability to tailor the thickness of the plates at essentially uh, every floor, every couple of floors on the way up the building. <clears throat> but uh, to make this kind of connection, we can uh, take a vertical, and in this case, the vertical element runs from a connection like this to a connection up there. In other words, the vertical runs two floors. Then we put these stubby beams out on each side and weld them with uh, continuous welding uh, to the verticals. And then we weld some more material in between. And by the time it's all welded up and ground down, you can't really tell whether the horizontal flanges or the vertical flanges were originally continuous uh, because everything appears to be continuous through that joint. 
And uh, I apologize for the fuzziness of this picture, but this sort of shows what the basic unit is. These are basically shear connections. And by the way, these horizontals have no loads on them because all the trusses that support the floors connected joints like that one and that one and that one. In other words, the columns are 15 feet on center. The joists are, truss joists are 15 feet on center. And the only loads that occur in these horizontals are shear forces that uh, occur under uh, wind load. So uh, these joints are pu pure shear connections. You'll note there are a lot of bolt holes there and there's a plate that goes from one beam to the next. That's the field connection. But all these welds were very carefully done in uh, a factory type environment where the uh, perfect perpendicularity of those joints was a crucial determinant. This is what it looks like on the inside of the building. Uh, of course here they're finished off with this beautiful stainless steel which uh, I think is just extremely elegant. Okay so here we have uh, another example of a moment connection. Here we have a spandrel beam and precast concrete that comes continuous across the joint. So we have a made up rigid frame which resists force in this direction and then we put a, a beam in this direction which is thickened over the column there and it can be moment connected so it can be grouted there and and post tension steel can be run up through the entire structure so now we have effectively a moment frame in this direction which resists wind force or seismic force in that direction um, and then we can insert this. So that's a shear connection. That's a shear connection. This is a moment connection. This is a moment connection. And these moment connections are moment connections in both directions. In other words, this vertical is moment connected to this horizontal, but it's also moment connected to that horizontal. And in this way, uh, relative to wind load or seismic forces in any direction, the stable is structure. The structure is stable. Here we've got some uh, double T's being added to create the floor, and then we can continue that structure on upward. And as long as we grout it to uh, distribute the stresses properly, and we post tension it, uh, the structure is very stable. Here's an example of a field moment connection. In the case of the Sears Tower, we mentioned that all those welded joints are welded up in a factory environment. You can produce field moment connections. So here, these steel plates were full penetration welded to the verticals. And then these insert plates were also full penetration welded. And then there's another plate on this side. So the beam comes and is rested on top of this. It's also supported, of course, by this uh, steel plate with all these bolts that are grabbing hold of the web of this wide flange. But uh, you'll notice that this bottom plate that's protruding out is wider than the bottom flange of this wide flange, which means that you can do top welding along this edge to assure the full transfer of force between this plate and the bottom flange. So for example, under gravity load, this beam is tending to rotate this way at this end. This beam is tending to rotate that way, which is tending to put compression in this bottom flange and compression in that bottom flange. So force is transmitted from this bottom flange into this plate continuously through that plate through that plate and then back into the bottom flange here. So we effectively have continuity of the bottom flanges of these beams all the way through this joint. And the field welding on that moment connection is the welding that occurs along this edge and along that edge. And then up above, we have a, a similar kind of situation. Uh, this one is much more difficult to do though because you'll notice that this requires overhead welding, which uh, involves a lot of skill. Um, and most of the time what we'll do is we'll make this plate narrower than the top flange of this beam. And then we can do 
top down uh, welding up here just as we did down there. But if we do that, this plate does not come out flush with the surface, nor does that because these plates have to be narrower than the top of this beam. Another thing we often do is take this plate and taper it into a kind of arrowhead so that there's a lot of welding edge that occurs on the top of, uh, so in plan, instead of this thing looking like a rectangle, it looks like a triangle that comes to a point out here somewhere and that allows a lot of uh, welding from above to complete that flange. Here's an example of a fully bolted shear connection. So this plate comes out and in fact this tube is slotted. This plate goes all the way through the tube and then is welded on this side and over on this side. And these four bolts connecting between this plate and this web are the shear connection that provides the vertical force that makes this joint work. So for sure, this beam absolutely has to be connected with some kind of element like this that provides the vertical force that allows the beam to work. Now, if this plate right here and those four bolts were all we provided here, this would be regarded as a pin joint because there would never be enough rotation at the end of the beam to significantly activate any moment capacity of these four bolts. There's enough play in those joints that you're just not going to get a moment capacity. But then if you come along and you have this plate right here, which can transmit tension forces in this top flange here over to tension forces in this bottom flange. And likewise, you have this plate, which is able to transmit compression forces between this flange of this beam and that flange of that beam, then you've got the makings of a real moment connection. But you'll notice it didn't take just four bolts. It took a dozen bolts here and a dozen more up there to make these flanges work as, and transmit a reasonable amount of moment through this column. And by the way, where this plate is concerned, there are two ways that it can be fabricated. It can be fabricated by cutting a hole in the middle of it and sliding it down over the column and then welding around the column. Um, and that cutting, by the way, can be done by a water cutter. It may come as a shock to you that we can cut steel with water. We have things called water cutters that shoot out uh, a little narrow beam of water that's about the size of a pencil lead, uh, but it comes out at 50,000 pounds per square inch of, of pressure, and it contains uh, materials uh, that are used, uh, abrasive materials, that basically cut through the steel. And it's really quite striking to watch. You can, you can cut a six inch thick steel plate with it, and it cuts through something like plywood as if it was butter. Um, so you can use water cutters, laser cutters, or really uh, fine torches. And all of those things can be electronically controlled to give you quite precise cuts. So this strange shape, which widens out, uh, can be cut with a hole in it and slid down over the pipe. Another thing that can happen is the pipe can be cut in segments. So here's a piece of pipe, there's a piece, and above there's a piece. And basically we cut the pipe, we insert the plates, and then we re-weld it. And if this welding is done very skillfully, it's as if this piece of pipe or tubing was continuous all the way through. But you need to make sure that you have a welding configuration and a welder that are capable of getting essentially a full penetration weld uh, in order for that system to work. So really crucial, this is the shear connection and this plus that make the moment connection to this beam. <clears throat> okay, so here is another way we can get a moment connection or a, a combined 
full load capacity connection. So here we have a plate which is bolted to the beam here and bolted to this stub of a beam. So the way this is made is um, here we have a column coming up. We have a beam running continuously across it. This piece of pipe up here, by the way, was the same as the pipe down here, except it got split in half and welded on to the face of this web and then welded to the top flange and it's also welded to the top side of this bottom flange. And then this piece right here of beam is the same as this kind of material except it was cut short and then it was coped. So this curved cut is called coping and it was cut to this shape so that it would fit around this round tube and then this was full penetrated welded. So what comes to the site is this beam and that column with this stubby piece coming off. And then the field connection is the bolting of this plate to the stubby connection, to the stubby portion of beam, and to the long spanning beam. So this is the shear connection that gives whatever X and Y force is necessary. And then the moment connection is achieved by putting these weld pieces underneath there to keep the weld from dripping through and someone is able to weld from the top and develop a full penetration connection between this bottom flange and that bottom flange of the stubby element that's sticking out. It is possible afterwards to go and grind off these pieces of weld plate that have no purpose there except to facilitate the weld. In the case of this building, they apparently didn't think it was worth the trouble to do that. And to be honest, uh, in my observations of human beings, very few people ever notice a, a little detail like that. So typically it's not worth your time, but again, it's an aesthetic judgment that everyone needs to make about how you want your building to look. Okay, so here's another example of a nice moment connection. So this beam comes across and gets welded to the vertical and then these infill plates are welded. And so we have this typical aesthetic where the flanges of the bottom of the horizontal elements and the flanges of the vertical elements appear to go continuously through each other and if it's if it's well done uh, you can't tell in the end uh, which was continuous and which wasn't okay so here's another classic moment connection this is a big fat joint and the reason it needs to be so big is because this is a table leg column and we one of the things we said when we talked about columns is that table leg columns are the weakest and uh, therefore uh, they need a really, really good moment connection at the top to compensate for the fact that there are these long, spindly, not very well restrained columns. So here we have a sort of classic frame with the moment connection at this joint. And we've talked about guidelines for the spans and proportions of these elements. This is a building not too far from here and the uh, velvet cloak. So we have a moment connection here, what's essentially a pin connection at the top because it's relatively weak. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that this bottom cord or bottom flange is in pretty severe compression. It wants to buckle laterally. In the case of this structure, you'll see these struts coming down from the purlins. Every purlin comes down and tries to help the bottom flange of this frame to avoid that lateral buckling. Um, I find these tacked on pieces not that appealing, uh, which makes me want to make this frame out of some kind of tubular construction, which by the way, it can easily be done so that the frame has greater lateral stability, but it's not typically done. And so uh, these kind of after the fact bracing elements are the common way in which that's handled. 
And I don't know whether that's bothersome to anyone else from a visual point of view, but it wouldn't be my fir first choice for how to do that. Okay, so here we have a rigid frame here and then a cantilever tacked onto it. And we'll talk about this kind of structure in more detail when we talk about moment distributions. But basically, this portion, which is cantilevering out, would normally be burdening this vertical piece, particularly in a structure like this, where the only thing that that can cantilever off of is the vertical. But if we come along and we add a cantilever, this cantilever is kind of counterbalancing that cantilever and a good portion of the structure is sort of balanced on top of this member. So that takes a lot of the burden off of this vertical uh, to handle those moment uh, effects of this cantilever uh, by itself. This member still needs to be pretty sturdy though because under lateral forces of wind or seismic effects it's the source of stability. So this table leg is like a cantilever coming down from this joint and that's the means of lateral stabilization of this structure. This is a very cool structure because these big overhangs allow places for cars to drive underneath so that people will come visit your showroom when the weather's not so good. Um, it also is a place to park some of your cars to keep them out of the rain so they stay nice and shiny and clean so that people can look at them and see them in pristine condition. A crucial problem with a structure like this is heat trains because this steel beam is all external and it's absolutely continuous to another beam that's internal and so you're going to have thermal bridging of a significant nature occurring in this structure. So here we have another example where we have basically a pin joint, a moment joint, a pin joint, a moment joint, and so forth. And you're looking at this and you're saying, well, that's still a moment joint, and you're correct. So another way of looking at it is we're putting the big, really huge moment joints where the problems are the greatest, and, and we're sort of tailoring the depth and the strength of the moment capacity in accordance with where the burden is the greatest. So here we have this beam cantilevering off of that moment joint, this beam cantilevering off of that moment joint, and then we have something like a simple span between there and there. It's not exactly simple span though, because if we have a pin joint there, a true pin joint there, 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 and there, we have what's called a four, pin, four hinged arch, which is fundamentally unstable. Three hinged arch is great, a four hinge arch is a really bad idea. So we still have to have some moment capacity there to keep it stable, particularly under horizontal forces. So a lot of the things I'm saying, by the way, are going to become much more clear when we go through beams and frames and you actually understand uh, the moment distributions better and then you'll understand where the shape comes from. But what you clearly want to understand is that's a major moment joint that's a major, major moment joint. That's a major moment joint. Clearly, we're not relying on this portion of the structure for so much moment capacity, and there's a reason for that. It's because the moment under any of our loading conditions is never going to be very large there. This is the pin joint at the base. Uh, this is never the way you would design a moment joint. That's a serious moment joint. There's another one. This structure, by the way, is familiar. This is Carmichael Gymnasium. It's curved. We look at it. We, we tend to think of it as an arch. We call it an arch. But in fact, it is very much like this structure in that there is no buttressing force out here. Uh, the outward thrust of this element is resisted in this moment joint. So we've chosen to articulate it with this nice curve and a lot of people think that curve is a lot more beautiful than that. And if that's what you think, then that's what you should do is make it a curve. But you need to understand this thick joint is the source of stability for this structure. And it's pretty important to be fairly thick there and very thick there. And when we go look at this, 
It's reasonably thick there. It's very thick there. It's exactly the way we want it to be to work as a good frame. And it's just thicker here than it needed to be. But we were happy to do that because we wanted to get this nice smooth curve as a kind of aesthetic expression. So it's perfectly legitimate to make the structure deeper than it needs to be in certain places as a kind of compromise between structural efficiency and logic on one hand and aesthetics on the other. Uh, generally speaking, I happen to think that aesthetics and structural logic tend to go fairly closely together, but clearly there are cases where uh, there are aesthetic goals that can be set that don't necessarily have something to do with structural logic. So in this case, this element being deeper or thicker at this point is not a huge waste of material and it does allow this nice smooth curve. Here's another example of a rigid frame that's pretty aesthetic. Here we have this nice rounded uh, semicircular element on the bottom. On the top we have uh, a, an arc of a circle with a much uh, less uh, severe radius and a greater thickness near the corners. This is not optimal. These circles here would be better off if we had some sort of radial elements coming from that corner. Uh, but the, the structure is much deeper than it needs to be at that point. And so that gives us the option to put this circle in as, a, as part of our aesthetic expression. So again, here's where structural logic has been set aside uh, slightly um, or structural efficiency in favor of a form of aesthetic expression. This is a really uh, amazing building uh, by Pierre Luigi Nervi. This is the Pirelli building. Again, we have this sort of table leg expression where it's super thick at these joints. In this case, he got stability from left to right through the moment frames, but he also crisscrossed the moment frames through the space, which gave him stability along the long axis of this building. There's also a cantilever out here, which creates these perimeter spaces where the mullions can be absolutely minimal because they have no structural function except to keep the glass from blowing in. So as a sort of spatial expression, this is a really exceptional building. We talked about the Johnson Wax building before. Um, there are moment connections between deep beams up above and the thick columns at the top. And likewise, there are deep beams running in this direction, which have been obscured by this lowered translucent ceiling. But there's basically each of these columns is moment connected to a beam running that way and a beam running that way, which is the source of stability in this building. Table leg structure, moment connected at the top. This is another example of the same concept. Quite beautifully done. This is a bizarre structure. Here we clearly have a moment connection where the structure is thickened out tremendously, and that, but it's one, one column. So we might be puzzled by what keeps this column from blowing over, particularly since the base of it doesn't look like a very good moment connection. That's the narrowest part of the column. And the answer is the way this column works is there are tension members all around the boundary that keep the column from flopping over. And then the shear deformation is accounted for in this joint. So in essence, the structure uh, under wind load from left to right is tension members over on this side, and then this big, huge moment joint providing all the additional structure that's necessary. This is um, a flagpole or tree structure also by Pierre Luigi Nervi. These are steel plate girders up above. These are gigantic, uh, solid concrete tree trunks. You'll notice they're very wide at the base, uh, 
And the reason for that is there's no frame action between these things. For example, this member is not connected to that member, so there can be movement occurring up here. And so we're not really getting rigid frame. Well, if I go back a bit, uh, which I really want to do, if we go look at this structure, you'll notice how this member gets fat here, but it's skinny at the base. And the reason is because it rigid frames across to there, and the base is, in essence, the width of this. When we come to this nervy structure, uh, we have no such connection across here. It could have occurred, but Nervi chose not to, and instead he chose to make this the profoundly important moment connection. So there are deep grade beams under here to which these tree trunks attach, and that's a source of stability. Keep in mind that trees are designed so that they move a lot, and in the process they shed load. Um, we don't tolerate that kind of movement in buildings, particularly when we know we're going to have glass right here at the critical point between the two trees where the maximum movement is going to tend to occur. You don't want a lot of movement where you have a lot of glass. So the tree trunks here have been made out of really strong concrete and they're really wide at the base to make them stiff enough that we get a behavior for this that's what we would commonly expect for a building. This is the uh, building during construction. Here's another example of a rigid frame. Here we have the classic thick joint, moment connected to the vertical, moment connected off to these cantilevers on each side. But then we have this odd behavior where it gets wider down there at the base. And the reason is there's a deep grade beam down underground and there's a moment connection between this element and the grade beam. So this column is actually flagpole up to here. It's table leg down to there. So the real moment is occurring here. And this is mainly a point of shear in this structure. This is an example of a similar kind of column, except in this case, because it's steel, they've expressed it in this triangulated way where they've made the column really wide at the top and then they've created this beautiful intersection at the midpoint. But this is flagpole down below, table leg up above, and expressed in a rather dramatic way. This is a building where that concept was employed so here we have a horizontal element, it's table leg down, flag pole up, and the columns can be much lighter uh, when you have flag pole up and table leg down than when it's all table leg because then your cantilever is basically twice as long. This is a student project that was done a few years ago. In this case, circles have been cut. Um, so we have this really nice moment connection in both directions um, and, and it works well with this uh, smooth circle. This is another nervy concept. Here you had a column that's wide at the base in this direction and wide at the top in the opposite direction so that he can get a moment connection between a beam here and a moment connection with a grade beam down at the base. So here you notice the base is much wider in that direction to moment connect to this grade beam and it's wide in the opposite direction to connect to that beam up above. And one of the things that Nervy was brilliant at is figuring out really inexpensive formwork that could be used to make columns that appeared to be uh, geometrically very rich and complex. So here's a structure that has uh, a moment connection to the ground. It has a moment connection to this tubular truss. Each of these trusses are moment connected to that tubular truss. So we have lots of uh, moment connections that are truss in nature rather than solid web-like in nature. Here's a classic flagpole. 
and this is the classic base connection for a column. This plate is about an inch and a quarter or an inch and three, excuse me, it's about an inch and three quarters thick and these bolts are like an inch and a quarter or something like that. And then this tubular uh, cantilevered uh, column is about three sixteenths of an inch thick or a quarter of an inch thick. So the plate in the base has to be much, much thicker than this material because this material is working in pure tension and compression under wind load. And by the way, this is the base of a tower that looks like this. So it's pure flagpole and there's no lateral restraint at the top. There's no resistance to tilt. There is no truss work connecting it to another member. There is no struts connect, moment connecting it to another member. This member is moment connected at the base and that is the only source of lateral stability. So here we have a five foot wide concrete uh, pier that goes uh, 40 or 50 feet down in the ground. It's augered out and filled in with concrete and uh, these anchor bolts go six or eight feet down into that concrete and they're wired into the steel reinforcing in the concrete. In this case, you'll notice these are what we call leveling nuts. They support the gravity load and also any downward force associated with wind force or overturning moment. And then these are the locking nuts and this is the classic base design for the moment connection at the bottom of any column. <clears throat> for years I tried to figure out some less expensive or simpler way to do this. I could never figure it out and I've never seen a good example of it anywhere. We always work with these anchor bolts and a base plate of this sort. <clears throat> we may have variations where we use stiffener members to allow us to make the base plate thinner. Uh, it's almost never worth the cost of doing that. It's cheaper to just get a thicker base plate uh, and in the end it's probably cleaner and easier. Now every once in a while you'll look at a situation and you'll see a column that's embedded in concrete and you'll think well okay somebody didn't use a base plate there instead they just held the column in place and poured concrete around it. Uh, and the classic place you see that is in service stations. <clears throat> where there'll be a concrete island and a column coming out of it and in the end you uh, look at that and you think it's clean and and you think it's just embedded in concrete but when you see it in construction you see it's the classic base, base plate with the anchor bolts coming out of the actual structural concrete foundation and all of this will be compact enough that when we pour this concrete island all of that gets covered up and you don't actually see that it's the standard base plate connection. Okay, so here we have a detail from the Wildlife Conservation Headquarters building on Centennial Campus. Uh, these were one and a half inch anchor bolts. They're being held in place uh, by this uh, plywood plate, which as we mentioned before, is for alignment purposes when the column is going to be put in place, the, the bolts will be, the nuts will be removed and the plywood taken away. But this is inch and three-eighths inch, one and three-eighths inch uh, steel rebar on the top and bottom of the grade beam that this column is attaching to. This column had an uplift force of about 850,000 pounds under wind loads. So this particular column would be on occasions inducing tremendous tension in the top of this grade beam, which is why you see this huge density of steel. The grade beam was four feet deep and there was another mat of steel just like this at the bottom of it to handle the gravity loads. These are the base plates. These are four foot by four foot by four inch thick plates. This is called a shear lug. We don't want to put all the anchor bolts that are going into these holes into severe shear because that will damage them. Um, so we use them for tensile connection or compressive connection depending on you know, whether the forces uh, 
at a given moment under a given load are up or down, but the horizontal forces are taken by this shear lug, which will get embedded in concrete. So unlike this column, where they never had enough shear force in the bottom of this to be of any significance, and in fact, the wind loads are almost, the uplift forces are almost as severe as the downward forces. Uh, so they never bothered grouting underneath this because there was no structural benefit to doing it. In the case of this building, the downward forces associated with gravity and overturning moments associated with wind uh, exceeded the uplift forces. So there was full grouting that was going to go on underneath these plates. And by the way, these columns are lying horizontal awaiting to be uh, lifted up by the crane and put in place. So this is the underside of the base plate of these columns. The base plate is four inches thick. Uh, and so one of the things we're using that grouting for is also to engage this shear lug so that the horizontal forces can be taken in the grouting and they don't have to be transferred to the anchor bolts. This is a little project I worked on years ago. It's a Montessori school with little vents down below for, for venting the space and another vent up here. Um, this is a wooden moment connection. And I just show this as a rare example of a wooden moment connection. We don't tend to do them very often. Uh, in this case, this element and that element are butting on the top and bottom of that element. Um, and then uh, these two elements run continuously through the gap here. So we're, we're sandwiching wood on both sides. There's a lot of extra material required here compared to steel construction because steel can be made totally isotropic with welding, but wood remains a fibrous material that's only strong in the direction of the fibers. So we got to figure out a way to literally bypass parts of the structure in order to assure continuity of the wood. And this uh, was a, a storyboard um, scheme that I worked up to talk about it, the exact assembly procedures. It turns out if you're going to do something unusual like this, you have to tell the builder exactly what's involved. In the case of this project, I put it out for bid and the building came in at three times what I estimated would be the cost. And then I went back and I did this storyboard where I worked out in detail every step of the assembly and explained it with great care so the builders would understand. And the second time the bid process came back, the building came right in at exactly my estimated budget. So whenever you do anything unusual, you need to understand that that's going to put some burden on you to communicate your idea and to get people on board with that idea. If you just toss it out there and they don't know what's involved and it's totally new to them, they're going to put a pretty high price on it. So this shows the structure and various stages of assembly and this would be the final version of it. Excuse me, that's the final version. Okay, so here's some other just uh, really quick examples of moment connections. Here we have a threaded rod, a one inch diameter rod that's threaded to receive a bolt in this direction. We're, we're putting that rod far enough into this horizontal piece so we won't get tear out of the grain at the end. And then this bolt comes and goes through that rod. And when you, when you crank up these two bolts and press them against the end of this board, you get a really good moment connection. This is a close-up view of that. So again, there's a bolt that comes through and this, this may sound odd that we have a nut, which is basically a round rod, but that round rod is inserted in the wood and then the bolt actually threads through the round rod. Here's another example of a moment connection. These are called floor flanges. We have a tapered thread here which engages a tapered thread inside the floor flange and that produces a very good moment capacity um, as a sort of 
routine detail at the end of a round tube or pipe. Here are some more examples. In this particular case, this plate on the bottom was connected through a threaded rod to uh, a bolted connection at the end there. And the moment capacity of these legs comes from that threaded rod pulling them up so tight against the bearing faces of these tubes that we are effectively getting a decent moment connection. It's not the full capacity, moment capacity of these tubes, but it's way more moment capacity than we need in order to make this work. This is a close-up view of that and another view. So here we have a floor flange as a moment connection and then down at the base of this we have a, a plate welded internally to this tube and that plate is threaded so that it can receive the threaded rod coming up from below into that connection and it's the tautness of that threaded rod that's pulling up everything in this zone to be tight enough to be a decent moment connection. Here's a brilliant historical example of a moment connection. This is the Breuer chair and according to Breuer he was a first year student I think when he invented this and he invented it because he didn't know how to make any connections so he just went to the shop and started messing around bending tube and eventually discovered that he could create this very complex structure with many really excellent moment connections uh, by using the ductility of the metal and basically creating the moment connections by never breaking the material in the first place. This is a great strategy to keep in mind. Uh, continuity of material is one of the best ways in the world to uh, maintain integrity and simplify your connection issues. These are some trusses in the uh, Midway Airport and I just throw them in as some additional examples. One of the things I like is this whole notion that rather than have everything on the same center line, which sometimes complement, complicates the connections, here they've got, they've taken the bottom cord and they've split it apart and they're bringing it up on both sides of these plates at the end. So they're basically getting a nice overlap there and producing a rather elegant geometry uh, where they're not fighting to make two things share the same space. And you get some really cool details like this. And there are all kinds of wonderful examples of complex joinery in modern architecture and you can go to the library and look under some key pa people like uh, Norman Foster for example and you'll see great examples of this. So that's the end connection where those tubes are welded on each side of the plate. So here are some other types of connectors. Between two pieces of wood you can use something called a Tico ring. So there's a tool you use to cut this groove. There's a bolt that you use to hold the two boards together but basically the transfer of force between this board and whatever board you bolt to it is occurring through this Tico ring. This is called a shear ring. In this case it goes into only one piece of wood. There'd be another shear ring into the adjacent piece of wood and then the shear occurs through the bolt. Uh, but the transfer between the plate and the wood occurs over this much larger surface. So all of these are ways of getting high strength steel to engage the lower strength wood and the large surface area of engagement is required by the fact that the wood has a lower capacity. That ends our video, the third in the series from chapter three, section two. So it's video C on moment connections or rigid joints and fixed joints.